I'm pleased to be here with Ron Moppet this afternoon on the occasion of his installation, Vincent's Last Studio, to discuss this work in particular, but also to talk about a variety of topics about art, living in Calgary, and whatever else might come to, to mind. Uh, Ron Moppet is known primarily as a painter, however, over the course of his long career, which spans over 40 years, he's worked in a variety of media, including collaborative multimedia installations and projects with John Hall, and recently with the artist husband and wife duo Dave and Jen. He's worked with sculpture, drawing, collage, and most recently as a mosaicist with the monumental work Same Way Better Reader, a major public installation for the city of Calgary. In addition to his practice as an artist, he was a curator for many years at the Illingsworth Kerr Gallery, where he organized first exhibitions of internationally known artists Robert Rauschenberg, Chris Burden, and Christo, and closer to home, Canadian artists uh, Arlene Stamp, Judith Schwartz, Katie Owe, and Michael Snow. His work has been the subject of two major retrospectives. Ron Moppet is the recipient of the Gershon Iskowitz Prize and the Alberta Centennial Medal of Merit for his contribution to the community. And most recently, he was honored by his alma mater, the Alberta College of Art and Design, with the Board of Governors Alumni Award of Excellence. Ron Moppet, welcome. Ron, I mentioned earlier that you're known currently and primarily as a painter, and I'm wondering why you chose to make this ambitious uh, installation at this time. Did your work uh, for the, on the usually successful public installation, The Same Way Better Reader, uh, recently unveiled here in Calgary, prompt you to move off the wall and, and into the entire space of the gallery? So the question is, why this piece now? And, and, and well, why this piece now? Well, I've been around long enough to accept all of the abuse that's <laughs> thrown at painters, but I wear that badge proudly. <laughs> and at the opening, I did enjoy a moment when somebody surprised at uh, the form that this exhibition had taken, um, commented that um, they didn't know that I did this kind of work. And I amused myself by commenting that, that being a painter wasn't a fallback position. So, but it is um, a more complicated and uh, perhaps a little more ambitious uh, amplification of, of a body of work that I did in the 80s primarily around the subject matter of Van Gogh. And I'm aware that there have been some analyses that suggest that I adopted the persona of Van Gogh, and that was never true. What I was interested in was the whole mythology around that particular artist, and particularly uh, given the pathetic situation that he found himself, and the fact that today um, everybody would, would want to own a Van Gogh. And, um, so what I did with that body of work was A, found a subject that I could sort of um, fall into, examine, uh, develop, um, and it proved to be um, a subject that was uh, immensely um, useful for me uh, in engaging my own practice and extending my own practice, but um, uh, it sort of set me free of, of wondering what to paint, or it gave me a subject that was a given um, in the way that a landscape painter would just go out and face what he or she is given, and so it gave me that. and. Um, so for quite a number of years in the in the late 70s or early 80s, um, I produced uh, quite a lot of a significant body of work around that subject matter. And interestingly enough, I uh, only recently found out that Joe Fafard was doing something similar, mm -hmm. uh, extending his practice as a sculptor. But more particularly, um, when you're a young artist, you're making stuff. Uh, when you're a little older, like
like myself, you find yourself managing stuff as well. And so I, I became aware that I still owned a number of these pieces from that time. And that if I were to put them out on display, they would be new to most people. Mm -hmm. And so that I found interesting, and so that's my curator person coming to the fore. And I'm also aware that repurposing work is not a new thing. Uh, Martin Kippenberger is a hero of mine, and he did much the same, and I'm sure there are many other examples. So I began to uh, arrange and model a space or circumstance that would exhibit um, work from the 80s again uh, and to revisit some of the work and redo some of the work and so some of the work in the installation exist exactly as they did then. Some have been slightly modified, some are brand new but engaging the same topic, so to speak. And another piece that I can think of, a very large diptych, is basically a 50-50 proposition where uh, half of it was painted in, in 1982 and the other half was painted this, this last year. Mm -hmm. The idea being uh, that um, as opposed to looking at a painting of mine, and usually they are painted objects. I, I tend to think sculpturally as well as, as two-dimensionally. That one would engage the locations of work in the room uh, as one would look at aspects of a painting on the wall. Right. So it's, it's just a, an enlarged experiential version of what I did. That, that prompts me to think and to ask you the question about, about two things. One, about scale, and, and two, about um, your work, particularly your larger work, your larger paintings, have always had, in my mind, a, a kind of sculptural quality to them. Um, the ability to kind of place the viewer in space, even though you're looking at a two-dimensional object. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've created a kind of dynamic in the work that, that suggests reflection, for example, on viewers standing here and being in your universe. Mm -hmm. um, does, does this particular, is this the logical conclusion, like in, in terms of coming off the wall and into the space to kind of realize that sort of more fully uh, in some ways? I mean... Uh, That's a reasonable observation. Um, I'm always aware of the objectness of things that I make and um, I'm not prepared to, to, to expand on the Van Gogh subject anymore, but uh, uh, this was as much tying a ribbon around that exercise, but very happy with the way um, it resulted. But I should mention that, that a key element in this, and it's true of the way I work, that often one has a notion or notices something and it becomes a springboard for the gathering of other influences, other um, ideas. And one sort of starts uh, not, not knowing where you're headed exactly. Mm. And a significant starting point for this uh, exercise was falling in love with a shed, a little sort of ruined single garage in a friend of mine's back backyard um, and I have a great fondness for those kinds of things uh, um, garden sheds and uh, writers cabins and, and uh, cabins in the woods those kind of sort of romantic spaces so to speak but the and so it was a it was a combination of things at one time that sort of came together so there was the shed there was the Van Gogh things, there was the idea of, of doing something a little different. I mean, I'm, I'm aware that so much that passes in the art world these days has become event-based and quite frankly just didn't want to do another Ron Moppet show in Calgary. I wanted to do something, um, something new and something that would sort of um, uh, 
push me and um, the shed and you know realizing what I had at hand and employing my curatorial instincts as well um, that gradually started together and I modeled it in my own studio which is not large but I was able to um, build on various aspects over a period of at least uh, a year and a half until we have what we have today. Mm -hmm. the, the one um, aspect of, of the shed part was that um, I toyed with a number of versions of the roof, for example. It wasn't my purpose to replicate the shed, although each end of the building are pretty true to, you know, in, a, in, a, in an abstracted kind of way to the, to the actual shed. But the roof, for example, was at one time going to be a painted uh, uh, canvas with uh, bird shapes on them, silhouettes that I've been using lately. And then uh, I thought of employing um, projected video uh, using cutouts and, and film. And then, quite by happenstance, ended up with a printed, commercially printed fabric of birds at twilight in Berlin, which gave me a sky and a roof at the same time. And that is partly where you were heading with your question, is that, is that notion of ambiguity, mm -hmm. the ambiguity of an object as well as a window, mm -hmm. uh, a here and there. Mm -hmm. and also um, um, ambiguity that's inherent in, in the kinds of things that I paint. Right. Um, on the shed, it, it has a kind of, uh, and, and I see the shed as a, as a metaphor for studio, Van Gogh's studio, your studio, any studio, any kind of creative space. The way you've lit the interior of the shed is interesting. It's it's in high contrast to the rest of the room. It's bright in there. Yes, it, it's and it's lit not so much for the viewer's benefit as for somebody who would be working in the exactly. shed. Exactly, yeah. and so it's emanating light and mm -hmm. emanating this kind of notion of of, of idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a kind of that's where it happens sort of thing. Yeah. And, and, but, but I, I, the way you've constructed it with these kind of haphazard bits and pieces, some fencing, some, an old blanket, a piece of plywood with paint on it, it has a kind of temporary shanty town kind of quality, Absolutely. just kind of migratory sort of, you know, it can happen anywhere. And yeah. we, we are in this art world now that is like that. The ideas are migratory, the, 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 the global kind of situation. Uh, suggests that art and ideas are really in flux around the planet. And this seems to talk to that a little bit, that, that the studio can be anything in a way, mm -hmm. uh, anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and the notion of making art is, is, is it, it's not about a box. It's much more open-ended than, than, than exactly. perhaps ever was before. It, is this show something to do about you know, this installation about the notion of how art gets made, how it, you know, there's a, when I look at the references, for example, uh, you mentioned Van Gogh, but there are other references. There's Courbet, there's Manet, Go Gauguin. there's Gauguin, yeah. there's, um, uh, uh, well, it goes as far back as Botticelli, but let, let's stay in the modern period for a second. Uh, all artists who were working mid 19th century at that moment when art really changes, when painting changes, particularly with Courbet's work, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and everything gets blown up at that point. And this installation suggests some kind of celebration of that moment where that freedom allows us to kind of cobble stuff together. The, the notion of assemblage kind of comes a little bit later, but and you've worked in that strategy yeah. a um, lot. Are, are we talking about those kinds of things well, in this basi show? Basically, I mean, I don't want to get too involved in over-signification, but, right. but um, you're basically put inside an assemblage collage, right. which is... Um, not a new idea, but uh, it's it's a different way of, of formatting my ideas and, and my interests at the moment. Right. And we should mention Manet and um, the top hat 
and and uh, and all the other wrinkles that are part of part of the exhibition. But it really is about um, that sort of turn of the century when, as you say, things change, and you're not just looking at at, at windows anymore. You're you're um, experiencing the world in a completely different way. Yeah. Things, information is coming at you rapid fire, and so I wanted that shed, that container, uh, that faux studio, to be um, rather scatter shot. You know, you're not quite sure what you're looking at, and you're looking through industrial screening. I didn't want it has in it the, the piece that I that is titled the bedroom piece, and. Uh, it's the piece that references Gauguin and also Courbet. And I wanted you not to be able to uh, confront it in, the, in the, the way you would normally in a, in a gallery. So you can see it, but you can't get that near to it. And um, so that's about... Um, the disinterest in Van Gogh's work at the time. Right. right? I mean that that work is not a a, a, a variation on a on a Van Gogh piece. Right. It's it's a piece a sculptural piece of mine um, about something about the mythologies around Van Gogh. Well, but, the the uh, other reference and, and to that end is is the Magritte Gritian kind of text. This is not about Van Gogh. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Which is... Yeah. yeah. And I'm well aware that uh, I live in North America and ambiguity is not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, your work, you know, to go back to your comment about here and now and there and, and here and there, um, your work is always uh, celebrated in some ways, in many ways, and also lamented uh, the fact that you are here in this great place but also small place mm -hmm. and, and so sort of insular uh, place mm -hmm. I'm not connected to the big centers and so on and so your or work is can always feel so it time. can feel yeah, so absolutely. at times yeah. and, and, yeah. and, 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 and I think in our world uh, the fact that we don't have a contemporary art gallery for example <laughs> public art gallery uh, speaks to that a little bit but, but um, you've always been able to kind of again celebrate being here uh, but always looking out and always bringing these other references, influences, ideas of the bigger, larger world, uh, and not only about the art world, but the, the larger world generally. And that, that conversation has been, I think, so wonderful for those of us who've experienced the work because it, it breaks through notions of regionalism and nationalism and all of that. It makes the work more international and, and in some senses, universal. Well, you're kind to say so, and I, I'm pleased. Um, I like my work to be, um, let's use the word complicated, um, I'm serious about what I do, I'm not interested in, in conjuring hors d'oeuvres, I'm going for a full meal. I right. mean, Mahler is one of my <laughs> favorite composers, <laughs> yeah. so I want all the weather and all the, yeah. all, all, all the bells and whistles. Yeah. Uh, Understanding that, um, um, and given my comment about ambiguity in North America, that that a lot of folks um, like things served up simpler. Uh, that doesn't interest me. So I've been lucky enough over the years to to be able to do what I wish to do, and, and that's a that's a real privilege. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the Canada Help Council has helped me greatly in that respect. So. Um, great debt to them, to that agency, and um, working as a curator not only uh, paid the bills at Safeway, but um, enabled me to travel more, meet more artists whose work I admire, mm -hmm. and to work with their work, mm -hmm. and uh, so, um, and we have a good airport in Calgary, if, yeah. no matter how much I might complain about this and other things, but uh, it all adds up to, um, I think, enabling the work to be as rich as I would wish it to be. Yeah. You know? Having said that, I, I don't want the work to be seen as 
uh, puzzling or enigmatic. Sort of, don't mind enigmatic, but uh, in the best possible way. But mm -hmm. I, I don't want them to feel like they're confrontational, um, as if one were an idiot if you couldn't, right. if you couldn't figure out all the aspects. Because many of the aspects, and I believe this to be true of what many artists do, are there for. Uh, one's own um, amusement or um, amplification or decoration or whatever. It's, I, I think it's absurd to imagine that every uh, square inch of, of anything is 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 significant. Mm -hmm. that, that's just silly. Did did you that that decision to um, to play in that that world of ambiguity? Um, I, I don't believe it was a decision. Okay. Well, 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 <laughs> I, I mean, I just I don't think I can help myself. Yeah. Okay. You know? And I'm 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 pretty much self-taught when it comes to color as well. Right. And I think if I can, I, I think color is a, is a definite strength of mine. But it's not as if I studied Albert Albert's at de at, in depth or anything like that. It's again, it's a it's an intuitive kind of a process. I asked a question, uh, going back to your early days, when you were working with John Hall, for example, and John went on to become a photorealist painter, and you went some other way, but you didn't go completely the opposite way of John. You, you landed in some place that is not entirely abstract. There are obvious, uh, clear, uh, recognizable mm -hmm. signs and symbols, for lack of a better term, in your work, and so I'm wondering if you say there was no decision; it came naturally. Is that is that really true? Was there no moment when you said, you know, I want to go here, and, and I'm not going to make a completely abstract painting? <laughs> I, 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 you know, was well, there? Well, both John and I um, <laughs> are very, you know, take our profession seriously, and John is is. Uh, like his work, a pragmatic nine to five guy. You know, the yeah. bell goes and off you go. Right? right. And I work every day, but it's not nine to five. It's something else. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. We we've been talking about a lot of things, and this installation um, kind of forces that issue, I think. And um, it's been very interesting to uh, watch people go through the installation and talk to people about the installation because it's it's. Um, it's a it's the kind of piece that builds on itself all of the various components you know after you spend some time looking about them and at them and then connecting the dots you start to get this general sense of what what this might be about or what the experience feels like um, and I, I don't know if you know but I'm a, a great fan of poetry and right now I'm kind of stuck on Al Purdy I've been reading everything I can about Al Purdy and another one of my favorite are, are poets is T.S. Eliot and for years I've compared your work to Eliot's work in that it has a kind of density to it and a, it has a kind of referential kind of quality to it in that it, it you know Eliot referenced everything under the planet uh, and but there was always a currency to it and I find your work like this as well it is poetic. It is one that that slow. Then we talk about slow painting, and the read is slow. And I, I, maybe we should talk a little bit about some of the various individual components of the piece, and perhaps we could start with the um, with the latter piece. And um, well, the latter is actually brand new. Right. You know, if other pieces are sort of new and sort of old, uh, this is brand new. Uh, it's cobbled together as much of the other work is, or collage, or assemblage, however you wish to, to call it. Um, the latter was actually um, made by my younger brother for my father. It's an orchard apple uh, ladder, and it's, I should add, finely crafted. There are no nails in the ladder. No, it's beautiful. It's <laughs> an amazing thing. Uh, but it's weathered nicely, and um, on an adjacent wall, there is uh, a large... Uh, wall applied uh, photograph of an apple tree. So they just sort of sit neighboring each other. So there's no um, A plus B here, but you will find that, that the, oh, those kind of linkages all through the show. So the ladder piece also has a carpet on the floor, which grounds the ladder and, and 
sort of um, facilitates its transition from itself to the concrete of the, of the gallery floor. And on the carpet are uh, Canadian dimes that have um, uh, sailboats on, on the back. I think it's probably one of the blue noses. Right. But anyway, as a silver circle, they're like stars mm -hmm. on this dark red background. Uh, you'll find stars throughout the installation in various ways. There will be uh, stars as one would draw them in a children's book. There are stars that are actually small mirrors on the night sky behind the shed. And I'm sure there's probably, uh, and there's stars as lights. Right. And uh, so dimes on carpet, um, to my mind, are up and down, uh, aspiration, and and you're you're here on this ground. Above the the ladder is a light, but the light is shaped as a top hat, which is a, a, a symbol sign that I've used frequently. It's a masculine sign, but as a light above the ladder, where the ladder speaks to aspiration. Mm -hmm. um, as in um, Blake's uh, engraving, um, which is something like "I want, I want," is you know, it's it's that's a, a more um, base version of the same thing. So we have um, Van Gogh wishing to be accepted, wishing to be, to you know, somebody would buy a painting, wishing to be part mm -hmm. of something, right? And it's not happening, you know. And so the the the, um, the top hat light is 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 another kind of moon or some other thing that he's aiming for some different status some mm -hmm. some acclamation something or another so those are the simple kind of versions and, and underneath the ladder is a sort of um, almost a tombstone. Box. It's a cardboard box, actually, that's been painted with sort of colored stones on one side, and on another side is the text, which um, uh, says in, in uh, Dutch uh, that this has nothing to do with Van Gogh, you know, the, the Magri idea. And on top of that is a shoe with a hammer in it, you know, so... Um, which, which seems to imply the notion of labor and work. Well, and sure. Class I mean, it, it's it's going way back to white to to Van Gogh's times when you would have uh, guys out on the road bashing rocks and, and and fitting them together to make a road or something like that. You know. So, so and the the top hat is actually a, a designer object that that I purchased. Right. Uh, so a number of different kinds of things from a number of different places. Uh, coupled together as a new sculpture, but embodying many of the same aspects of, of, of um, almost signage, if you will, that you'll find in the rest of the, of the installation. So um, there is a, an early collage piece um, on the other side of the gallery, which employs three different small black and white photographs which are sort of travel pictures so again the notion of trying to get from one place to another but the text that accompanies uh, those photographs are taken from distilled um, program notes from your TV guide <laughs> and taken out of context they are truly absurd you know so one of them says something like Brian talks about his guide dog Judy or something like that, you know. It's it, and like, what? So, and uh, yeah, but that that speaks to the kind of dailiness of our existence. Well, absolutely, too, and which is another right. kind of theme that's in your work. The kind and of every day. Adjacent to that collage is a, is a, a sculpture that also is exactly as it was, which has a red light hanging from the ceiling, a steel plate with twelve little plastic chairs around it, a fan that blows air across the plate and uh, radio which is in the shape of a little plastic doll and the radio is tuned to your average 
commercial radio and just goes. And it becomes like the animated version of the dumb text that's in the right. that, that's in the frame um, collage. Right. right. And there's an additional uh, sort of program note kind of text that's on one of the doors in the bedroom piece. Right. And there's a a star uh, in the collage. So you know. Um, they all link across the room right. from piece to piece, and you can travel with the memory of that piece and say to yourself, oh, there's a star over here, but it's different than that star. So there's a star thing going on, mm. and, you know, that kind of thing. I, sh I should add that the use of the industrial fencing at the front of the shed was a way to achieve some transparency. I wanted the person, the viewer, to be able to see the piece inside it, but not apprehended as directly. And, and that's part of the sort of pathetic side of, of the Van Gogh story, where um, for all of his purpose and all of his uh, talent, do we still use that word anymore? Um, nobody was getting to his work. Nobody was getting his work. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, I've, so I've caged it almost like it was it's inaccessible. It's inaccessible, but it's also, in a way, there's an awareness of it. It's it's like the zoo purports to be saving animals or something. It's, right. it's saving something about Van Gogh in this enclosure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'll allow you a glimpse of it, but you can't get too close to it. Um, you, you mentioned uh, while well, we're talking about the various components and how one can connect the dots and spin around the installation and eventually perhaps some kind of meaning or uh, starts to kind of you know, evolve. Um, yes, because I, you know we've talk and talked around the notion of ambiguity, but never do I want any of my work to be about whatever you want it to be about. It's, it's, it's not that trivial or right. silly, but it does accommodate the viewer. It yeah. does say that yeah. you're an intelligent person you're interested in looking what, at what I've made, and this is what I've put together, and I think this is interesting, and I want to share it with you. Right. And you, as the viewer, then participate, and you come along with me uh, and amplify what I've done, give it meaning, if you will, mm -hmm. right? And start to try and get at the content of the piece as opposed to what one might imagine the subject matter to be. Right. One of the things that, um, one of the uh, visuals that, that helps us move through the installation is the female figure. Mm -hmm. And for years I've, I've noticed that your work has both a kind of masculine quality and a feminine quality to it. And you, you speak often clearly about that. Um, well, the simple version, of course, is the artist and the model. Of and course, the, the which the model is model traditionally being a female, and um, so there's a uh, one notion of a model in the bedroom piece, right. where you have a, a reclining female figure, and one half of that painted representation is literally taken from a Playboy centerfold, right, and the other half of the figure is a, a, just a line drawing representation, two-line drawing representation. Right. And so you almost get a little sense of movement in that. You do, actually. And, uh, and, that's, and that's what I wanted. In the, the painted diptych, you have a silhouette shape. Right. Um, and true to what I've been doing for some time with silhouette shapes, she's represented as a single color against something like a window. Right. And she's obviously a modern woman, she's wearing high heels, and closer to that playboy model person, although she's standing on a very uh, uh, simplified version of a shell, so trying to reference Botticelli in some modest fashion right. on a side of the diptych that is pretty much the artist in the studio. Yeah. It's an inside yeah. side of things. Yeah. The other side, while absolutely not totally outside, or a landscape per se, is 
that kind of a space that's much more open. Yeah. So you have this inside outside thing again. Yeah. Th there, there's a very, uh, a, a, um, a, a varied and different quality at that end of the installation as opposed to the other end. There, 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 for me, anyways, I, I find that when I'm standing at that kind of in that triangle between the painting, the ladder piece, and the the face of the shed with the door, those three components speak to each other in a in that notion of aspiration. For example, the light and the top hat, the the work of the studio, all of that. It's it becomes very clear and very um, celebratory is not the right way, but this kind of acknowledgement of of um, of how art gets made, or or, or the, the the process of it, and as you move away from that and into uh, looking into the shed itself, um, and you begin to sort of get this sense of tragedy uh, because of the text that's in the in in on the door panel, and then you look at that really lonely kind of feeling uh, sculpture with the radio figure and the empty chairs. And then at the back of the shed, you're in this kind of dark area, and there's that very beautiful and but very. It's almost like you forget that it's there. That map-like little painting that is almost as if someone's trying to kind of chart out a course, and you end there actually in the darkest spot, oh, that's trying to. It's almost as if like you're losing the light and you're trying to navigate at night, and this little drawing painting thing is. Is a representation of There's that. There's also a black, uh, roughly four foot by four foot silhouette abstracted shape at the end, which is sort of a, a bit of a sort of a spooky specter sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there is um, that, I think, referencing some aspect of mortality. Yeah, uh, you know, feel that. Without being, um, you know overly romantic about things. <laughs> it's not romantic at all, actually. I think it's just, it's, it's, it's almost, well, there's the memory of Van Gogh and all of that, what we've been talking about, but there's just the reality of, of, of the thing. And I think you've expressed that part of it beautifully. It's, it's really, it's really, in the end, it's what it's about, somehow. Thank you. You know, moving through that kind of psychological, emotional space, which is which is really what it's all about, isn't it?